what do you believe are the lifestyle habits that accelerate aging? Yeah, really, it's the lifestyle of today's modern age, unfortunately. It's kind of this idea of being in comfort, of not moving, of eating foods that are hyper palatable. Those are the types of things that actually will make you die younger and will actually age you prematurely. It's all those things that are comfortable sitting on your couch, watching TV all day, scrolling on your phone, eating easily accessible foods that are so easy to just overeat. These are the types of things that can age us prematurely and that cause us to unfortunately end up not living as long. And I think one of the telltale signs of aging is somebody's skin, which is why I think so many people are interested in things like Botox and filler and plastic surgery, because they want to appear that they're younger than they actually are, right? So what are some of the signs that somebody is not aging as gracefully as they could be based on their skin? Yeah, I mean, that's a good question. And it's true exactly what you're saying. There actually are studies that show that the younger that you look on the outside, the longer that you actually live. Now, the question is that correlation or causation, there are actually twin studies that looked at twins, identical twins. And in general, the younger looking at the two identical twins, genetically identical, tends to live longer than the one that doesn't look as old. Um, so what are some of the signs that we see on our skin that cause that are really signs that let's say your lifestyle isn't conducive to living a longer, healthier, more youthful life? Uh, well, the first thing is going to be actually the overall health of your skin, the color of your skin, how vascular it is. So in general, somebody who has healthy skin has a healthy pinkish color to their skin. Obviously, if you've got darker skin, then that's a different story. Uh, but in general, there is a healthy glow that you can see in people's skin. Now, that's not the same as, let's say, redness and ruddiness of, let's say, rosacea and people who are inflamed. That is different. Uh, but if I see somebody who comes into my office looking at their skin, I can have a pretty good idea of what their lifestyle is. So I can tell a smoker the moment they walk into my office because a smoker's skin is going to be drier. It's going to be flatter in color and in texture, and you're not going to have that kind of underlying pinkish color. On the flip side, I mentioned earlier, somebody who has more ruddy skin, people who, are, who have like areas where they're quite red and other areas that are quite pale, then oftentimes that's a sign of, of inflammation. So people who are eating an a inflammatory diet, people who are not exercising, people who can even be very stressed, all of these are signs that, can, that you can see on the skin. Our skin, interestingly, it's like a magic mirror, a friend of mine calls it that, of what's going on the, on the inside of your body. Let's pick a few things apart there. So you mentioned stress, mentioned nutrition. We talk about both those things a lot on the podcast. What exactly does stress do to the body in the sense where it can actually have such an impact on your skin? Well, you only need to look at the United States presidents when they enter office and then four years later when they exit office to know that stress can really create major, major problems in the skin and, and in the overall aging process. Now, there are a lot of, uh, of reasons why that can happen. Um, part of it is kind of this whole idea of chronic stress can create chronic inflammation of your body. So for example, one pathway is cortisol. You know, it, cortisol basically is a hormone that is secreted uh, when you're under stress. And it basically, it's kind of like a fight or flight type of a response. And so it's good to have short-term periods where the cortisol spikes because that's normal and it can actually help activate longevity pathways. But in those of us who are chronically stressed, then that cortisol level is excessively elevated for long periods of time. And that can actually be harmful. It can cause inflammation in the long haul. It can cause weight gain. Weight gain tends to be fat. Fat in and of itself is inflammatory as well. So a lot of these pathways kind of go together. Uh, and, and so what you're looking at with stress is it's just one of those that can really impact your body in so many different facets. What's going on when you just see somebody and you can tell that they're worn out? They got like bags under their eyes. You can tell they probably haven't slept well in a couple of weeks. Is their skin just super dehydrated? There's just something going on internally. Like what's, what's going on there? Well, the way I look at it is there are five main causes of aging of the skin. Uh, and so each of these can contribute to the appearance that you're describing. So for example, first cause of aging of the skin is nutrient depletion. Our food is not as nutritious as it used to be. Uh, and that's one reason why a lot of people in natural medicine are recommending supplementation because our food isn't of the same nutritional value as it was 
uh, for, let's say, our grandparents. Second cause of aging of our skin is a, uh, is a depletion of collagen. So once we hit our about our mid-20s, we lose about 1% of the thickness of collagen in our skin every year. Uh, women after menopause literally will lose 30% of the thickness of their collagen in the first five years after menopause. Uh, a reduction of collagen, a thinning of collagen, a degradation of collagen, that's the number two aging factor of our skin. Third aging factor of our skin is chronic inflammation. That's where things like chronic stress can come into play. Uh, chronic inflammation that can also be contributed to by, let's say, a poor microbiome. If you've got an unhealthy microbiome, uh, that can contribute to it. Also eating a lot of sugar. Eating a lot of sugar can increase uh, inflammation of the skin as well. Fourth cause of aging of the skin uh, is free radicals or oxidation. And you find a lot of these in ultra processed foods. And these are basically just harmful molecules basically that can uh, attack basically the DNA of our cells. You know, and if you talk to people, they say, hey, you, know, you should eat a, a diet full of colorful fruits and vegetables. Those are filled with antioxidants. That's actually the pigment is the antioxidant. That's what fights free radicals and oxidation, that fourth cause of skin aging. And then the fifth cause of aging of the skin is a buildup of cellular waste. Uh, so basically the fact that we're alive, our body creates cellular waste. Waste products are inside our cells, like used proteins, used organelles, you know, discarded mitochondria, those types of things that can actually build up inside of our cells. Our body has an innate regenerative or recycling mechanism called autophagy that will recycle this intracellular waste but in order to do that, you have to ideally run out of, of fuel. So that's where fasting or intermittent fasting can really help with the aging process. And so when I look at why somebody looks older than their years, I really focus on those five causes of aging. Once again, real quick, it's um, nutrient depletion, it's collagen degradation, it's chronic inflammation, uh, oxidation or free radicals, and then that buildup of cellular waste. I know you outlined some some recipes and foods in your book to help people kind of reverse the aging process and improve their overall nutrition quality in their life. Like what are your what are some of your favorite tips other than you mentioned eating the colorful fruits and vegetables? What are some of your other tips besides that? Yeah, so a couple of things to focus on if you're looking at true aging of the skin. The first thing I mentioned is so we can really look at it from okay, based off of the actual aging factors of the skin. And so one of them I mentioned, collagen degradation. Well, collagen is a large protein. And one of the things that we're not doing necessarily in our diet is getting enough healthy sources of protein. And so looking at good healthy sources of protein, such as grass-fed beef, uh, pastured pork and chicken, ideally wild-caught fish, those are great ways to get good healthy proteins in your body because if you don't have enough, then that collagen degradation is gonna continue to occur and you're not gonna have enough protein to basically fight it off. Another thing I mentioned, chronic inflammation. Okay, once again, we mentioned chronic stress can uh, impact that. Eating too much sugar can impact that. The health of the microbiome can impact chronic inflammation. So how do you get a healthier microbiome? Eating fermented foods. You know, our diet here in the United States is essentially sterile now. You know, there really are very few fermented foods in the diet anymore. And so by eating more fermented foods like sauerkraut, like miso, like kimchi, kombucha, Kefir, these are all great ways to get healthy probiotics into your body, into your gut microbiome, and to help support that. So eating some fermented foods, ideally you can do like two or three servings a week just to start with, and that's usually pretty good. It's a lot better than the vast majority of people have. Um, and then I mentioned earlier, you know, the whole oxidation, free radicals, really that's gonna, that is gonna come down to the colorful fruits and vegetables because that's where you're gonna get the vast majority of your antioxidants, vitamin C, vitamin E, uh, those types of things as well. I've seen like a lot of skincare products today, they make a big push for vitamin C. Why is vitamin C so important for the skin? Yeah, so vitamin C is interesting because, you know, I mentioned earlier just a second ago about oxidation and vitamin C is an antioxidant. It's probably the easiest one to get. It's water soluble, meaning that uh, it's one that you can't, you know, if, if you, um, you can't get too much vitamin C, you know, if you get more than your body needs, you will basically pee it out. 
but at the same time, your body doesn't store it. And so it's important to get vitamin C rich foods every single day. And where's the vitamin C coming from? Well, basically colorful fruits and vegetables. Uh, and so some people think vitamin C, oh, isn't it just citrus fruits? It's like, no, actually there are vegetables, there are green leafy vegetables that contain good amounts of vitamin C as well. So that's part of it. So part of it's an antioxidant, so you can take it by mouth, by eating the you know different types of foods. I, I'm definitely a fan of vitamin C supplementation. I think that's a great idea as well. But you can also apply it to your skin. You know, vitamin C can fight those free radicals by applying it to your skin. And one of the big steps in a good skincare routine is a vitamin C serum. So usually in the morning, I recommend applying that after your cleanser and before you apply any type of sun protection. Um, so that's going to work for that. And then the final thing you got to think of with vitamin C that people don't think about is that vitamin C also is essential for collagen synthesis. So here we are going back to those kind of reasons why we age, collagen degradation. How do we once again help to promote collagen production? Well, vitamin C is absolutely essential to the production of collagen. And this goes back to, you know, back in high school uh, biology, uh, and I guess maybe even history, we learned about scurvy and about how all these pirates and people would go out in the seas for months at a time, and then they would run out of fresh fruits and vegetables, and eventually they would get these lesions in their mouth and on their skin, uh, and that's because they were missing vitamin C and the collagen in their body was breaking down. Uh, and so vitamin C, three different ways to get it, eating it in your foods, eating it as a supplement, and then applying it to your skin as well. What other things do you recommend people use on a daily or weekly basis in order to optimize their skin health? Um, so if you're talking about skincare products, uh, I do think it's really important to try to get on a, in a routine that you can keep up for a long time. So for example, there are routines that people will recommend. You know, I'm, I'm Korean. The, the Koreans are like all about skincare but they will literally do a 12 step skincare routine. So it's like you start with an oil cleanser and then you do a gentle cleanser and then you apply your uh, toner and then you do a serum and then you do an essence and then you throw a mist on, then you do a mask and then you do the sun protection. It's like crazy how many steps there are. You don't have to do that. Uh, and it can be very confusing. You know, you go to Ulta, you go to Sephora and there's so many products out there. Like, what do you use? So I try to get people to start with the bare basics. And especially, you know, I'm a guy, you know, you're a guy and we're used to just in general using bar soap on our face, washing it, you know, using a dirty towel then walking out the door. It, it really can help the aging process if you just do some very simple steps. So the first thing I recommend is to use a cleanser every morning, use a cleanser appropriate for your skin type. So Doug, if you've got oily skin, then you want to go for a more foaming cleanser. If you have, let's say, more drier skin or sensitive skin, then a milky or a hydrating cleanser can work better, okay? And we mentioned earlier before we started this interview about bar soap and like, why is bar soap not necessarily the best thing for your skin? Well, bar soap is not necessarily meant for the face and it has drying factors like surfactants. There's one called sodium lauryl sulfate. Basically, it's a foaming agent that can also be irritating and drying to your skin. And so bar soap isn't the ideal solution. There are a lot of facial cleansers out there that are inexpensive, that work well, real well. You can get one you know, from Cetaphil for less than $10 that can last you many months. Um, and so definitely start by using your cleanser in the morning. You want to follow that up with a, a, a vitamin C serum, like I mentioned earlier. Most skincare lines have a vitamin C, um, so get a vitamin C serum. Uh, and then I, after that, you, I in general recommend if you're going to be out to use sun protection, at least SPF 30. If you're not going to be out, I think it's fine not to use it, even though my dermatologist colleagues will disagree with me on that. That's all you have to do in the morning, Doug. Cleanse, vitamin C serum. If you're going to be out, throw on some sun protection. That's all you have to do. What do you do in the evening? Super important. You got to cleanse your skin every night. Okay. If you only cleanse your skin once a day, do it at night because you got to get worth it, rid of that day's worth of dirt and grime and pollution and, and all of that. Then I do recommend using some type of an anti-aging cream. And the most common one is a retinol. That's what most plastic surgeons and dermatologists would recommend. They're the most studied. It's a derivative of vitamin A. And it really of all the different ingredients that we have in anti-aging creams, that's the one that's most studied, and it's also usually not that expensive. So you apply a retinol at night. If you are in, let's say, a real dry climate or you've got dry skin and you wanna throw a moisturizer on top of that, feel free. 
but you don't have to. Moisturizers are optional. If you've got real oily skin and you don't want to apply moisturizer, then don't. That's okay. And that's all you have to do at night is cleanse a retinol and optional a moisturizer. And then the only other thing, Doug, is maybe once or twice a week, depending on how your skin tolerates it, you want to exfoliate your skin. You can do that with a gentle scrub, or you can do that with, let's say, an alpha hydroxy acid like at-home peel or mask or something like that. And that's just going to get those upper layer of dead skin cells turning over more quickly. Uh, that's going to cause your skin to feel smoother. It's going to get that skin turning over more quickly, so it's going to look and feel younger uh, in general. Uh, and that's it. I call it the two minutes, five years younger skincare routine. Uh, very simple. It definitely works. We actually tested that very simple two minutes routine on people, people who had quote unquote average skin. And we found that two months later, if they were consistent with that, they looked upwards of five years younger. And how would you tell that they looked five years younger? Like what, what, some, what were some of the qualities in, of their face and their skin that you would look for? Yeah, the skin looked a bit brighter. It looked slightly tighter. Um, we found sometimes even the little spots had gotten a little bit faded. And that's really what we found just overall. It's, it's, there's no like, you know, you can't, if you say, hey, is this wrinkle going to go away if I do it? Well, probably not. It's just a kind of this overall big picture where the skin just looks brighter tighter, a little bit smoother, that type of thing. And what we ended up doing is we took photos before and after photos and we put them on Instagram and we basically did a, a survey, an informal survey of how much younger do they think they look? Do they look older? Do they look about the same age? Do they look five years younger, 10 years younger? Uh, and five years is where approximately these settled at for the most part. I know like one of your most popular videos is about things to not put on your face. Yeah. <laughs> I'd love to know maybe an updated list of maybe you're the top five things somebody should never put on their face. Yeah, so let me think here. So one thing definitely I would not recommend would be alcohol or alcohol-based astringents. Um, so back when you and I grew up, uh, people were using alcohol as basically toners on their skin. And the idea is that you put that alcohol-based toner on your skin uh, and you wipe your whole skin off and your skin feels so squeaky clean afterwards. But then you give it about 10 minutes and then the face starts feeling drier and tighter and even uncomfortable. So then you would apply a moisturizer on top of that. Uh, and then people who have a lot of, let's say, acne and oily skin oftentimes would, would use these alcohol-based astringents and toners to try to basically get rid of the, all that oil. The problem with it is a couple of things. Number one, if you've got really oily skin, if you get rid of all that oil using something like alcohol, your skin is going to uh, then notice that that oil is gone. And what does it do? It creates more oil. Uh, and so you get this kind of negative feedback loop that happens where your skin creates even more and more oil and you're trying to clean it off more and more and it just gets worse and worse. Second thing is that we know like the gut has a microbiome, our skin has a microbiome too. There are trillions of bacteria that live on the surface of our skin. And if these are healthy bacteria, then it can cause our skin to feel and look healthy. But if it's unhealthy bacteria, then it can create inflammation. Uh, it can create uh, issues like uh, eczema and things like that. Um, and so what, what you're doing if you're using alcohol is you're basically stripping your skin of these uh, healthy skin bacteria and causing you to have a potential higher risk of inflammation and, and, and even premature aging. Uh, so that would be the first thing that I would not apply on your skin. Second thing, and this is kind of a, it's kind of funny, but it's a little unusual. Uh, our menstrual is menstrual blood. There is this trend towards using menstrual blood masks uh, that people do, and they believe that that's going to make your skin healthier afterwards. Uh, but that, there's no science to show that that is the case. Uh, menstrual blood contains more than just red blood cells. It contains white blood cells. It contains basically sloughed endothelium from the inside of a uterus. Uh, and it can contain bacteria and viruses and even fungi that can create an infection of your face. So you may see some people go online, they say, oh, this is great for your skin, and it definitely is not. Uh, a third thing, oh, we're getting gross now, Doug. I don't know if your audience wants to hear this, uh, but this is probably in the video, and I think you're talking of my one of my most viewed videos that went viral, um, but it's, I don't want to say the word for it, but it's basically a man's ejaculate. <laughs> <laughs> there are videos where people pie down the skin saying that this is, no, that's not good. You can get an STD from it. You can get infections. So stay away from that. Um, other things that you want to avoid applying to your skin. Uh, let me think, you know, there's something that's kind of interesting. Uh, and some of our natural health colleagues are really into it is applying lard uh, or beef tallow to the skin. And that's interesting because it's not an all bad or all good thing. 
Um, so the idea really is that you can use lard or beef tallow as a moisturizer of the skin. Uh, it does contain some healthy fats that can be helpful for the skin itself. Uh, the reason why I'm not a huge fan of it is number one, there are some people who will make it themselves. Uh, in general, there's a question about the shelf life of how long can it last on the shelf. It can potentially last up to a year, some people say, before it goes real rancid. Um, but unlike, let's say, an actual skincare product, you don't have an expiration date on it. And so there's the risk of that. Um, and so in general, if you're going to apply something like that and you want to go super natural and you like the idea of lard or beef tallow, then there are actual commercially available skincare products that do have it in it uh, that are you know, perfect for people who want to go in that direction. So I would go for that. Try not to DIY that. And then I think, well, you have one more left. Let me think what would be something not to put on your face. You'll have to come back to me on it. I'll have to think because I'm blanking out on something that would be an interesting thing that people are using on their face. What about what about like touching your face with your hands? Do you think that would fall into this category? Yeah, in general, because what happens is your hands have bacteria on them, you know, depending on what you grab and stuff like that. So in general, if you're going to be um, applying something to your face, uh, definitely you want to wash your hands before doing that. One of the things that you find in people who have, you know, adult, let's say acne, acne is an inflammatory process. Some of it is mediated by, by bacteria. Um, if let's say you find that, geez, you know, I'm an adult, you know, if, it's one thing if you're a teenager and you've got hormone fluctuations and stuff like that. I mean, that's hormonal. But if you're an adult and you're having unwanted acne, there are potential sources of it that you can impact yourself. So for example, if you talk on your phone a lot and you've got acne on your chin, then it's possible that you're getting bacteria from your phone that is actually getting on your skin uh, and increasing acne that way. And so washing your phone, keeping your phone clean is a good idea. Same thing with washing your pillowcases. Uh, if you've got issues with uh, inflammation of your skin, if you've got acne and you go, well, geez, you know, I don't wash my pillowcases more than once a month or something. That's a bad idea because especially if you go to bed with wet hair, your pillowcase can be a breeding ground for bacteria. Uh, and so changing your pillowcase regularly, limiting the amount of times you go to bed with wet hair also is very important. Um, and so those are some of the things definitely you, you, you want to watch out for. One final thing, actually, if you're saying, okay, what should you not put on your face? There is a, um, and I was on the uh, Live with Kelly and Mark show yesterday, and one of the things that we covered were things not to put on your face. And one of the things that Kelly and Mark both do is they put toothpaste on their pimples. There is this belief that putting toothpaste on your pimples at night can, when you wake up, the pimple is, is smaller and it's dried out, and that's just not the case. Toothpaste can be very irritating to the skin. There used to be an ingredient called triclosan, uh, that was in toothpaste that was actually a drying agent uh, that is no longer in toothpaste anymore. If you've got a breakup, if you've got a pimple and you want it to be smaller in the morning, if you've got an activity to go to, simple thing, there are pimple patches that you can buy at most drugstores. Or if you don't have time for that, if you just take one of those small circular band-aids and you put that over it, that by actually covering a pimple, it can help reduce inflammation. And in the morning, that pimple is smaller. And so regarding like getting rid of things like pimples and acne, is there anything you would recommend like on a, from a daily perspective to make sure that people are doing what they can to prevent and reduce acne? So acne, when you think about it, it is an inflammatory process. And once again, you know, hormones can play a huge part of it. So you see a lot of uh, acne, obviously, in children as they're going through puberty, but you also see it in women who go through perimenopause. They start having acne issues that even if they've never had acne before in their life. Um, and so hormonal issues can be one part of it. Um, taking that out of it because that's something you want to speak with with your doctor. Uh, what can you do just daily activity-wise and maybe diet-wise that can impact it? Uh, well, the first thing is going to be lowering the amount of inflammatory foods that you eat. Uh, and so what are some of the most inflammatory foods? Well, sugar. Sugar is huge. So trying to avoid uh, foods with added sugar to me, that does not include fruits and uh, because, you know, I know in some circles there are some people are anti-fruit because, yeah, fruit contains uh, fructose. Um, but you also have so many good things in fruit from vitamins uh, and phytonutrients and fiber that, that I don't think fruit technically contributes. You, you can't eat too many blueberries and cause yourself to have acne. Um, but once again, sugar, you know, foods with, where they're filled with sugar can be pro-inflammatory and that can definitely worsen acne. So reducing the amount of sugar that you eat is good. A second group of foods that can be inflammatory is dairy. And there are studies that show that reducing the amount of dairy you eat can improve, uh, especially adult acne. Um, you know, my wife is a pediatrician and for years, 
she encouraged her her moms and dads to give their kids milk. You know, that's kind of what the general recommendations in standard pediatrics is. But what we're finding is that that's not necessarily all that helpful for kids, and it can be harmful uh, with, once again, inflammatory pathways. And so I'm not a big fan of just drinking milk. I'll tell you, I love pizza, and I'm not a big fan (laughs) of non-dairy cheese. So I think that that's something that definitely is moderation. But if you've got issues with acne, um, then one of the things you may want to try is reduce the amount of milk that you eat uh, or drink uh, and dairy products and see if that makes a difference. You know, Just to do it for two or three weeks, you may be able to see a nice change. Uh, and then ultra-processed foods and fast foods, those two filled with free radicals, uh, those can really create inflammation of your skin as well. Before we went into what not to put on your skin, you talked about like a routine that people can do that takes two minutes and that you've seen kind of reduce the aging process of the skin by five years. How long were you testing people for that process? Um, So it was two months. So we put them on it. Yeah. Now these are, you know, I I do uh, interviews and we talk about it. it, This is something where if let's say, just throw somebody out there, Angelina Jolie or Kylie Jenner started doing this skincare routine. Are they going to look five years younger afterwards? Well, no, because they've got really, really nice skin. Uh, so, so we're talking about the average person who maybe hasn't taken great care of their skin. Uh, that's what you may be able to see. But yeah, but somebody who's got like perfect skin, then obviously that's not going to make them look five years younger that quickly. So from a lifestyle perspective, other than nutrition, what are some of the other things that you have people focus on, again, on like a daily or weekly basis to make sure that they're optimizing the aging process and making their skin look as good as possible? So I am a fan of supplementation. Uh, I'm not a biohacker. I don't take 50 pills a day or anything like that. Um, But I do think that supplementation can be helpful and more and more science is supporting it. A big subject is collagen, collagen supplements. You know, these are super popular right now. You know, I have my own skincare and supplement line called Yoon Beauty, and our top selling product is our supplemental collagen, as our collagen peptide powder. Uh, and it's because I believe in it and it definitely works. So, what's the deal with collagen? So, I mentioned earlier, Doug, that we lose 1% of the thickness of collagen every year. Women, unfortunately, you know, menopause 30% over the five years after menopause. So really one big focus is we want to try to prevent our skin from losing collagen. Collagen makes up about 70% of our skin. And it's a part of our skin that causes our skin to feel tight and firm and smooth. And so it does make sense that as you lose collagen, your skin feels looser, it feels rougher in texture. And you can see women who are, let's say, in their 70s and 80s, and some of them, the, the skin is so thin that they scratch it and it actually tears. You know, I've seen that, you know, in so many people. Um, so finding that that collagen thinning process is super important and collagen supplements can definitely help with that. So if you were to ask me 10 years ago, you know, is there science to support collagen supplementation? The answer is it's kind of equivocal. It, there isn't a whole lot out there. But in the last couple of years, Doug, there have been some large meta-analysis studies, uh, one published in 2021 of over 1,100 people, and another one published just last year in 2023 of over 1,700 participants, where they have taken two to three months of a hydrolyzed uh, collagen peptide supplement and found improvement in the thickness of collagen of their skin, in the hydration of the skin, and in the elasticity of the skin. There are so many studies now that have shown that taking a collagen supplement definitely works. But the key with that is that you your body can only absorb a, either individual amino acids or small chains of peptides, okay? Because collagen is a large protein and your body cannot absorb just collagen. That's why if you put a collagen, let's say in a cream and put it on your skin, it doesn't do anything because it's too big. It can't get through your actual skin. Uh, And one of the arguments that people have made against collagen supplements is that it is a large protein and how do you know your body is going to actually absorb it? The collagen supplements that in general I recommend are hydrolyzed and that means that they've taken that large protein And they have broken it down into individual amino acids and small peptides, which are small chains of amino acids. That has allowed it to be more bioavailable, so your body will actually absorb it. And there are actual studies that have put people on these supplements, and they have actually drawn their blood later on and found increased levels of collagen precursors and things in their actual blood. Um, And so these collagen supplements do work. Uh, I do recommend that's something for just about everybody. Um, and that's something you can do every day. Uh, a second thing that you can do every day, or maybe a couple of times a week, actually not every day, you don't need every day, uh, is red light therapy. 
Uh, this is also a very hot topic uh, in natural medicine. Many studies now that are showing that using red light therapy can actually help improve the health of your skin, can increase the collagen and the elastin in the skin as well. And these, we think that red light works by basically powering your mitochondria to essentially create more energy, and that causes the cells to function in a more youthful fashion. What about things like sunlight? So, you know, sunlight is a double-edged sword. I think that sunlight is great, especially in the morning. Uh, obviously, you need sunlight to, for your body to create vitamin D. Uh, studies and, and most experts agree that you need about 15 minutes of direct sunlight on your body to create enough vitamin D to prevent a deficiency. Interestingly enough, Caucasians need a little bit less they're the 15 minutes, but if you have darker skin, you need more than that. Sunlight, I think, is super important for your circadian rhythms, but it's also excess sunlight is what can create skin cancers. You know, I'm a plastic surgeon, Doug. I have seen patients who've had skin cancers on their face, and it is nothing that you want. You know, I've had people who come in, people who are you know, just beautiful people who have taken great care of themselves and they have just a little dot on their nose. See, yeah, I'm going to go see a dermatologist tomorrow to get it taken a look at. It turns out to be skin cancer. And then they come see me and half their nostril is gone. Uh, you know, it's, it can be really disfiguring. So I really strongly recommend, I know there's a group of my friends who are natural medicine people who are really, you know, pro, Hey, get as much sun as you, as you want. You know, I think that there is a, a happy medium there where you can get that sun because I know it's so therapeutic, but at the same time, not overdo it and increase your risk of getting a skin cancer in the future. Because God forbid, you do not want a skin cancer on your face. Uh, and this has to do more than just like melanomas, which can kill you, but this is just vanity of like, I don't want to be, I don't want half my nose gone. Uh, and I've seen these types of situations in my practice and it's horrifying. This episode is brought to you by Apollo Neuro. If you're anything like me, you may have a hard time sitting still, sleeping, and practicing things like mindfulness and meditation. The Apollo wearable has been a great tool for me. It helps me manage my stress and calms me down when I'm feeling overwhelmed. The Apollo wearable was created by Dr. Dave Rabin, who is a board-certified psychiatrist and neuroscientist and has studied resilience as well as the impact of chronic stress on our lives for over 15 years. By using soothing vibrations, the Apollo directly engages with your body's nervous system to naturally regulate stress responses and promote a state of calm. The Apollo is more than just a wearable. It's a lifestyle enhancer designed to support overall wellness and well-being. When my stress is regulated, I sleep, function, and perform better. I highly recommend you check it out. And when you go to apolloneuro.com slash Doug, you can save 15% off an Apollo wearable. Again, that's A-P-O-L-L-O. N E U R dot com slash Doug to say 15% off an Apollo wearable. Now back to the show. Some of the other things you've talked about in your book, and I've heard you talk about on podcasts is like obviously managing stress, the importance of that on aging and our skin health. What are some of the things maybe you do personally, or that you recommend to your patients to help them manage their stress so that, so that, so that it doesn't impact the aging process? Yeah, I did. Uh, it's, it's funny. I did an interview with a friend of mine, Shailene Johnson, on my podcast. I've got the Dr. Yoon Show podcast, and we were talking about stress. And one of the things that she mentioned to me, I didn't really think about it this way so much, but it so makes sense. And it does match with my worldview now is that, you know, I'm 51 and I'm kind of in that sandwich generation now as Shailene was. And I'm not sure how old are you, Doug? I don't want to. I'm, I'm 36. Yeah, so you're younger, you're much younger than us. Uh, but eventually you're going to get to that point where you're in that sandwich generation too, where essentially you're taking care of your parents and you're taking care of your kids, you know, because the parents have gotten older and they need help and the kids are still young enough that they need your help. Um, and that can create a lot of stress. Uh, and I think one of the things that we see, and especially for me uh, being a physician, we are taught throughout our, all of our training that anytime somebody asks something of you, it's a privilege for them to ask something of you and you should give it to them. Uh, and so what does that mean? Our patient's number one. If our patient needs you, then your patient has to be your number one priority always. Uh, number two, our hospitals. You know, We work at different hospitals and, and all that. And if, and if you are so lucky that they ask you to be on a committee that meets at 7 a.m. every Wednesday, and you don't, you know, it is an honor you should say yes to it because they only ask people who are, you know, who are really re respected. Even though your time, they, you know, they don't pay you for that. Uh, same thing with our societies. Like it's an honor to be in our society and to present at our annual meetings and to create a two, you know, uh, spend 
five hours creating a 10 minute presentation and then they assign you Sunday morning at 7 a.m. with five people in the room. But it's an honor to do that because you're doing it for the society. And what I have realized as time has gone on is that if you say yes to every opportunity that presents itself, all you're gonna be doing is doing things for somebody else. And some of these things maybe you don't want to do, you know? Uh, and so I finally, I, I had a friend of mine, we were talking and he's my age and he said, you know, I've decided to live my life is that if it's not a hell yes, it's a no. Uh, and I thought, you know what? That is so wise because what is a hell yes to me? Number one is spending time with my family. Okay. Because when I, you know, as I'm getting older my kids are, you know, my son's graduating, he just graduated high school. He's, you know, going to college. It's like the most important thing right now is spending time with him and my family. You know, what else is important? Well, I, you know, my business, my practice, you know, is so important to me because that's what's given us our livelihood. Uh, but also my health, you know, I don't, I, you know, one of my big goals, I have a 16 year old daughter is I want to walk my daughter down the aisle someday when she gets married. And I don't want my health to get in the way of that. And so that's something that I have learned. And it's kind of this sandwich generation too, is we're so used to taking care of everybody else. We're not taking care of ourselves. Uh, and so that's a, a huge thing is make sure you take time to take care of yourself whether that is taking time to do whatever is your recreational activity. So important, you've got to exercise because you know one of the best activities for living longer is exercising. And we can talk a little bit more about some uh, recommendations there. Um, but it's also taking quiet time yourself, doing things like meditation. Uh, I think yoga is so, so great. But even meditation, just taking that time to meditate, to take time to slow everything down and give your body a rest is so, so important. And obviously getting enough sleep, you know, that's just absolutely key. Yeah, what are your thoughts on exercise as it relates to skin health and aging? I'd love to, love to hear it. So there are a lot of studies that show that exercising can, can be super beneficial for your skin, not only from those things that, let's say, getting blood flow to your skin, uh, but also just from the different longevity factors and longevity genes that get activated by exercising. You know, there's this idea that, you know, everybody is really into it now, it's hormesis. Uh, and it's hormesis is something that we see, you know, it's kind of the idea is you put your body under these short term periods of stress and your body reacts to it by basically being younger, by activating these longevity genes. It's the same idea when we actually do skin treatments, you know, when you think about it, okay, we do a chemical peel, we put an acid on your skin, that acid damages your skin. And the idea is that as your skin heals, it heals in a more youthful, tighter fashion. Lasers do the same thing you know, uh, radio frequency and all these, a lot of these treatments that we do on the skin, it works off of a very similar process. Um, and so exercising is just one way, like to create that hormesis where you, you break your body down, you break down those muscles, but they grow up, they grow back in a better fashion. One of the big things that I'm a huge fan of uh, is yoga as a part of the workout routine. Uh, and, and this came to me because as I see my parents getting older, and even some of my friends getting older, what happens as we get older is that we start getting less mobile. We start losing some of our reflexes. And one of the big things that we don't work on uh, are fast twitch muscle fibers. Uh, and so I think it's so important, you know, there's this fallacy that all you need to do as you get older is walk, you know, and that's what my in-laws and my parents do. They're like, oh, we walk, that's our exercise. But when you really think about it, when you're walking, what are you doing? You're using those muscles that propel you forward. Okay. And that is fine. And getting your steps in is definitely really important and can be great for your health. However, what you're not doing is using other muscles. Okay. So what are some of those other muscles? Well, those are muscles that may propel you backwards. Those are muscles that may stabilize you if you're falling to your side. Uh, there are studies that show that if you break your hip over the age of 50, there is a very high mortality rate if you break your hip. Uh, and that's one of the things you do not want to do. And so as you get older, it's so important to vary your exercises, to do things like yoga, where you're going to work on your balance so that as you're walking down steps and you miss a step, you're not falling on your face or falling on your hip and breaking something. And it's also important to do things like weight, weight training, where you're going to work those fast twitch muscle fibers that are going to be those muscle fibers that will stabilize you in case something unexpected happens. Uh, I have seen people where uh, they're older. And, you know, if you think just, for example, we're not going to get political here, but okay, you, you see our president Biden walking, you know, walking very gingerly. And you know, if he trips on something, what's going to happen, he's going to go flat and hit his face on the ground. Like there's no like 
arms coming back out. There's no, none of this, like legs are going to, knees are going to bend and he's going to stabilize himself. He's just going to go flat on his face. And this is what we want to avoid as we get older. We want those fast twitch muscle fibers working so that if we do trip on something, our body, like we would when we were younger, goes into like the mode where we're going to stabilize ourselves very quickly. Uh, and, and it's doing a wide variety of workouts, a wide variety of different things uh, that can really help with that. I'd love to to dive into sleep a little bit because I think that, you know, you can kind of tell by looking at somebody's face if they've slept well or if they haven't. Yeah. I mean, you, the, it's like the old adage, like, oh, you look like you just rolled out of bed, right? Talk about the importance of sleep as it relates to aging and keeping our skin as healthy as possible. Yeah, I mean, this is gonna be really coming down to the whole allowing your body, obviously, to rest. When you look at it from an exercising perspective, is it's kind of like rest periods are so important because you're you're doing certain activities like exercise and like being active throughout the day where you are breaking down some of the muscle, where you are stressing your body. The part where you actually heal from that, where you actually get your benefits is not the actual act of exercising, but it's your body actually reacting to that, mm. creating new stem cells, healing the body to be in a better place. And that's the idea really with getting enough sleep is, is part of that process. It's like if you're redoing a kitchen, you know, the demolition is only half of it. The other half of it is the regrowing of it is that is you're allowing your body to regenerate. And that's the importance really with sleep. In my book, Younger for Life, there are several uh, tips for people who are trying to get better sleep. Uh, because I know it's hard. You know, one of the things that's interesting that's been an interesting topic lately is menopause. Uh, and so, if you know, women in menopause, they find that their sleep gets really, really uh, impacted by the decline in estrogen as they go through the perimenopausal process. And so, uh, hormone uh, HRT, hormone replacement therapy, can really improve that for women who are going through that period. So, if any of your listeners are women who are in their, let's say, 40s, uh, they're going through some of those menopausal transitions, then definitely talking with your doctor if you're having a lot of sleep issues, which is so, so common in that, in that group. Um, talk with your doctor about HRT because that could potentially help other things that you can do, you know, really that is a specific time you're talking about skin. That is a time where I recommend applying your active products, you know, so like, like I said, the retinol, um, because you can get, you know, hopefully six to eight hours where that product can really just seep into your skin and do its wonders, uh, before you wake up. Uh, and that's why we do recommend those types of actives before you go to bed. Uh, but there are other tips too, with helping with sleep, uh, putting your room at 68 degrees studies show that is the optimal temperature for sleeping. Some people like it colder, you know, up to you, but in general, 68 degrees is good. And I also recommend keeping your, uh, ideally your phone away from you while you're sleeping. Uh, there are some studies that show that EMFs can, especially at higher levels, can potentially impact your sleep and your circadian rhythms as well. And then a lot of this just kind of sleep hygiene, you know, trying to go to bed a similar time every night, waking up a similar time, that type of thing. When it comes to things like Botox and filler and stuff that people do to, I guess, make their face look better, younger, make it look like they're aging more gracefully. Do you think that somebody's wasting their money on stuff like that if they're not doing the things we're talking about, if they're not working on their lifestyle? You know, I don't know if I would say it's a waste of money, but I think that you are, you know, it's kind of like when I have patients who come in who are smokers and they're like, yeah, I'm a smoker, but I want to get chemical peels. It's like, huh? I mean, you're going to, you're, you're going to be prematurely aging your skin while we're fighting the aging. It just doesn't make a ton of sense. Um, and so, you know, with fillers and Botox, they target certain things that maybe a diet is not going to impact. So for example, you know, the 11 sign, these are the wrinkles between your eyebrows that, you know, we create when we're scolding our kids and stuff like that. And as we get older, those wrinkles can get fairly inset. Uh, you can eat the, you know, best diet, you know, you can apply sunscreen and stuff, but because those are dynamic wrinkles, they're caused by muscles and gradually those wrinkles will get inset more and more because they're created by these muscles. The only way to really prevent that would be doing Botox because that will prevent those muscles from doing that. Same thing, you get nasal labial folds and you know, we both have these. These are these creases that come from the side of your nose down the corners of the mouth and you have them Yours are a little bit deeper than mine, but it doesn't mean that you're unhealthy or you're eating a poor diet or anything like that. Some of this is genetic and some of it is gravity. Uh, and filler is a great way to try to smooth those wrinkles out. And so I think that, you know, it just depends on what you're looking at. If it's quality of the skin, 
then yes. If you're like, hey, you know, my overall skin is getting looser as I get older, uh, but you're on this terrible diet, you're not taking care of yourself, you're not exercising, then yes, you're really kind of in, it's in like in that smoking versus chemical peel type of a situation. But there are other things, like I said, that Botox and filler may treat that isn't because, aren't due to, let's say, uh, a bad lifestyle. They're just due to you know, genetics due to being older uh, and sometimes just due to kind of where muscles attach and things. But for something like wrinkles or what I'm, I've now done nothing but stare at for the last two minutes after you pointed it out, <laughs> I'm kidding. Um, you know, babies have those too. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm kidding. Is the only effective solution Botox? Um, so for certain lines, unfortunately, yes. So there are dynamic wrinkles and these are wrinkles caused by muscle contractions. Typically, those are the 11 sign, the, the frown lines between the brows, the horizontal forehead wrinkles, and the crow's feet wrinkles. Those are the three most common groups of dynamic wrinkles. Um, yes, if you do chemical peels, if you do laser treatments, if you use retinol, then those wrinkles may be a little bit better, but they are caused by these muscles, muscle contractions. And unfortunately, the, the most effective way to get rid of those is to stop the muscles from contracting. Now, there are people who try to do that naturally. There was an sto uh, interesting story uh, from a long time ago where, and I don't know if this is true, but it's, it's lore, that Elvis Presley forbade Priscilla Presley from elevating her brows and creating wrinkles of her forehead. Uh, and that that was one reason why her forehead was so smooth as she got older. I don't know if that's true, but there is truth to the fact that if you can train your muscles not to create those lines, those lines won't happen. Uh, there are people who will put actual tape type devices or silicone pads over parts of their face as a way to train their body not to create those lines. Uh, essentially what you're doing is you're preventing, you're trying to train yourself just not to make, you know, not to do that. Uh, and there is some truth to that, but it's hard, you know? I mean, Jim Carrey is somebody who I think, it's so talented guy, love a lot of his movies, but he ain't aging that well because he's got this rubber face and making all these, you know, facial expressions. You know, that's something that will get inset in. So it's true. Your if your mom says, "Hey, if you make that face, it's going to stay that way," there is some truth to that. Are there products you're seeing people promoting right now that um, are a waste of money for people? Um, yeah, let me think here. Products that are a waste of money. Yeah, I mean, there are certain categories of products that are wastes of money uh, because they really are not necessary. Um, so, for example, there are uh, a group of products called like essences and mists. And these are basically products that you spray on your skin. They're kind of like a toner, but the idea is that they add some uh, hydration to your skin. You don't need that. You can just go with a regular moisturizer. Um, so those, that's a group of products I feel like is unnecessary. Uh, in general, toners are not all that necessary. Some people like applying a toner to their skin. Um, so what toners basically is traditionally people will cleanse their skin and then they would use a toner afterwards. I mentioned earlier how they used to be astringents and have alcohol in it. Now the idea behind toners is that they will balance the pH of your skin. You know, that you know, if you use a cleanser on your skin, the idea is that the cleanser sometimes are very basic, meaning it will cause the pH to go higher. And your skin is naturally slightly acidic, and using a toner it can bring that pH back to normal. Does that really make a change in your skin? I don't know. There's some people who love using toners. My mom, you know, I have a toner in my Yoon Beauty line. My mom, I swear to God, uses a bottle every month or more. Uh, she loves it. Uh, I myself don't even use a toner. You know, I don't think it's all that necessary. If you're a skincare enthusiast and you want to use it like my mom, then by all means do it. But that's something you could potentially save your money with. Like, How does somebody know they should go see a professional about their skin versus trying to do the DIY route? Yeah, I think that the first step is always to do what you can with number one skincare. And so doing, let's say, a skincare regimen like I recommended, if let's say that's not getting you, what you where you want to be and you're using, let's say, a retinol every night, then apply a second anti-aging cream, like one that contains Bakuchiol. Bakuchiol is a great one, or peptides. Uh, there are uh, uh, creams that contain peptides like copper peptides that can be very healthy for the skin as well. So the first step is you want to go use your skincare regimen and ideally give yourself a good four to six months, okay? Literally four to six months. If you want to do more during that time, then I would recommend a red light device. Uh, you can buy a tabletop one or you can get masks, red light masks that you can wear. They're not cheap. You know, you're probably going to spend a few hundred dollars on a fairly good quality one, uh, but those... Once again, great ways to do it at home. Uh, and compared to the cost of seeing a doctor, it's not so bad. 
And then I do recommend, like I mentioned earlier, taking, let's like, say, a collagen supplement that can also help with the skin. You want to do those types of things, okay? And if, if you just limit it to that for a good four to six months, see how your skin feels. If you're seeing nice improvement of your skin after that, then continue because these treatments will help to improve it. If, however, you say, yeah, that's not getting me where I want to be, maybe I'm not seeing what I want to see, then the next step would be to see a professional because maybe what you're looking at are wrinkles that can only be improved with either injections or maybe chemical peels or laser treatments or something like that. DIY treatments, and you can find them now because of the internet, you can find DIY treatments that can be very aggressive. You know, I have I have people who I've you know seen on social media where they have applied uh, what are called TCA peels. These are very aggressive, strong acids to their face, and they do it at home because they can buy it overseas and they you know have it sent to their house. And they do literally chemical peels that I do in my office, monitoring a patient super closely. They'll do it to themselves at home. You know, you don't want to get to that point. You know, really stick with the skincare. You can add things like red light therapy. Once again, add those supplements. But when you go, when you need to go past red light therapy um, or these or at home type devices, like their at home IPL devices that are in general safe, that are FDA cleared for safety here in the United States. But when you go past that, if you give that a good six to 12 months at least, it's not doing it. That's when you definitely want to go see somebody. One of the biggest things that relates to lifestyle, especially now, is mental health. And we talk a lot about mental health on the podcast. And I mean, I would imagine a good amount of people come to you and come to other plastic surgeons out of a place of despair or low self-esteem, low self-worth, because they're trying to fix their insides with something on the outside, right? What's your overall take on that? And then how do you help your patients assess and um, like work on their mental health before you know spending tons of money on these surgeries? So, you know, what we see is about 1% of the population has body dysmorphia. Uh, body dysmorphia or BDD, a body dysmorphic disorder, is basically a psychiatric condition where what somebody sees in the mirror is different than what is reality. Uh, so for example, you know, you may have a small bump on the nose and you and I, you know, I look at it and I'm like, oh yeah, it's a small bump. Your friends are like, oh yeah, it's a small bump. But to you, when you look in the mirror, that bump looks massive. It looks the size of Mount Rushmore. And so what do you do is I tell you, hey, you know, it's a tiny bump. Why are you bothering with it? It's, it's, not, it's fine. But you see your reality is different. So you see plastic surgeon after plastic surgeon after plastic surgeon as a way to treat a perceived deformity that was never truly there in the first place. And so this is what can happen to some patients. Is, and, and the nose is the most common area of the face that has this type of body dysmorphia. And that's why you see people like Michael Jackson and, and all these other people where they get all these nose surgeries and their nose gets whittled down to almost nothing um, because they end up having surgery after surgery after surgery. And they're never happy because once again, their vision of reality is not correct. You know, it's, it's, it's distorted. The problem with body dysmorphia is that a good percentage of the population has it. Like I said, estimated at 1%. Uh, upwards of 10% of plastic surgery patients have it. But the problem with it is, is it has very poor insight, meaning that people who have body dysmorphia don't know that they have it or they don't believe they have it. And so, you know, they may come to see me and say, hey, I want a nose job. And I go, you know what? Your nose is beautiful. Like, don't do anything. Leave it alone. And they go, what an idiot. He doesn't know what he's talking about. Look how horrible my nose is. And then they go to somebody else. And eventually they find somebody who will do whatever they want as long as they pay them. And then they get a nose job. It doesn't look right. And now they got to fix it. And it becomes this kind of, uh, uh, unfortunately, downhill slope of operation after operation after operation. So the problem is, is people who have body dysmorphia don't know they have it. Like it's just, that's one of the definitions, unfortunately, of body dysmorphia. And so my recommendation is, is if you're listening to this podcast, you go, you know what, I've, I've seen a couple of plastic surgeons and they keep turning me down, then that's a sign that maybe what you feel is wrong with your appearance is actually not wrong at all, you know? And maybe what you're seeing in the mirror isn't really reality. As hard as that may be to accept that, you know, somebody is telling you that what you see with your own eyes may not be true, maybe that's the case, you know? And, and, and if you are seeing reputable plastic surgeons or dermatologists and they're saying, don't do it, you don't, your lips don't need to be any bigger, your nose doesn't need to be altered, your breasts don't need to be bigger, anything like that, and doctor after doctor is saying no, then try to take that basically as a sign that maybe what you are seeing in yourself is not reality. Talk with your friends and your loved ones and say, you know what, 
am I seeing what's, you know, is, is this right? Is my nose really that big? Or, you know, do my lips, you know, really need to be bigger and see what they say and believe what they tell you. Because sometimes we are our worst enemies, you know, and we look at ourselves and go, oh my gosh, I look so ugly. Or oh, look at the skin or look at my, but in, in reality, we are beautiful. We just don't give ourselves a credit for it. Yeah. There's people that I know that have gotten so much plastic surgery done that they actually look older like they're like in their early 30s but they look like they're in their early 40s because they're getting the work done that somebody in their 50s done or they're getting the work done that somebody in their 50s gets done and now that's like bringing them down to like look kind of like they're 40 and it, and it just kind of defeats the purpose i would love to hear your thoughts on that and then also like you've been doing this a while how has the average age of your patients changed over the years um so the average age changes because as you get older your patients, it's interesting, your patients in general feel comfortable with doctors who are of somewhat similar ages. And so traditionally what happens in a plastic surgeon's career, mine's been a little bit different just because of my media presence and all that type of stuff. Uh, but traditionally what happens is that when you start off practice, you're young, you see younger patients who want things like lipo, maybe implants and that type of thing. And as you get older, you you know, you know get, let's say in your mid thirties and forties, and now you're seeing patients who are wanting tummy tucks because they've had children. And then as you get into your fifties, sixties, and, and hopefully you're not operating too far into your seventies, uh, you're seeing patients who want facelifts. Uh, because in general, they feel more comfortable with people who are of a similar age than them. Uh, but as, what you mentioned earlier is very true. This is an in interesting phenomenon that what we're seeing is we are seeing younger people who get plastic surgery and it makes them look older. Essentially, I think what we're seeing is it's kind of like the real housewifeization of Americans. And what it is, is that people who are in their 50s and maybe older are getting work done to look a certain way, okay? And then people who are younger get that same work done to look like that. So they end up, you end up taking somebody who's in their mid-20s or maybe 30, they get a bunch of work done and they look like they're somebody who's in their 50s trying to look like they're in their 30s. Uh, because it's similar work. It's the lips being plumped up. You know, it's the eyelids being pulled back a bit. It's the overly tight jawline and things like that, that becomes, you know, kind of these telltale signs. Another way to describe it, honestly, though, is it's a Kardashianization of America, is it's everybody wanting to look like a Kardashian. They want to look like they have high cheekbones, plump lips, a V-shaped jawline, uh, hollow, you know, these cheek hollows that come in. That's kind of the Kardashianization of of Americans, of the American woman. And that's the direction that's been going for the last probably 10 years or so. So what do you say to the, the person who might be in their mid twenties, early thirties, probably a bit young to be considering some of these, some plastic surgery and stuff? Like, what do you tell them to focus on instead? Well, the first thing is, is that beauty is health. You know, there's beauty in everybody, but really I think that the, that that if you look at it from perspective of healthy equals beautiful, that's what I try to encourage people. Uh, and then the other thing I always go by is you never regret plastic surgery you didn't do. You only regret the work that you did do that you never should have done in the first place. Uh, and so always using plastic surgery as a last resort. You know, my book itself, we talk about auto-juvenation and this, this, it's this idea, and I feel like it's true, that we all have innate regenerative abilities to turn back the clock naturally but we have to give our bodies uh, basically the right environment to do so, you know, and it's focusing on diet, it's focusing on skincare, non-invasive treatments, those types of things that, that really is what creates all of that. Uh, so if you're in your 20s, you're listening to this and you're like, well, I'm thinking about getting some cosmetic procedures done, then always use these things as a last resort. Start with the skincare, do some of the non-invasive stuff if you want, you know, but keep in mind that when you start getting into needles and God forbid scalpels, now you're getting to a, a place where you may not be able to come back from, you know? And so only do that as a last resort if, if you absolutely feel the need that, that nothing else will make you happy. Love that. Anything else you think the audience would find valuable as it relates to aging, reversing aging, skincare, health and wellness, diet, lifestyle? I think the thing to keep in mind with all of this type of stuff is that it really comes down to what I mentioned earlier is healthy equals beautiful, you know? And, you know, there, there's things that you can't, change genetics, but genetics really is only 20% of how you age. The other 80% is up to you. And it's doing those things to auto-juvenate your body to a younger you. You know, it's eating those 
the right types of foods. You know, it's avoiding those, those types of bad foods. It's using a good skincare regimen like we talked about. Non-invasive treatments if you want to do that. And then lifestyle modifications, you know, doing things like, you know, obviously exercising, getting enough sleep. Uh, stress reduction, all that type of stuff. That's what you want to really focus on. You know, it's like you're building a house and the house is basically the whole anti-aging part of it. The base, the, the, the foundation of the house is the food that you eat. The first floor is going to be how you take care of your skin. Surgery and injections, that's like the spire at the top of the house. That's something you look at way later on if not, none of the other stuff is getting you where you want to be. Well, Tony, this has been a great conversation. Thoroughly enjoyed it. I think my audience is going to get a ton of value out of it. If they want to get a copy of your book, your latest book or your, some of your other books, or if they want to connect with you on social media, where's the best place to do that? Uh, so my book itself is called Younger for Life. We have a website called autojuvenation.com. If you do buy the book, we'll give you $30 to our online store, Yoon Beauty, where you can get skincare and supplements and all that. And I've got my own podcast, uh, The Dr. Yoon Show as well, where we cover a lot of these topics as well. So appreciate you. Thank you for having me on. You got it. This was a great conversation, like I said, and the audience, I believe, is going to really enjoy it. Thank you so much for watching. If you like this video, I really think you're going to like this video as well. I'll see you there.